thanks so much for that. So it's a real pleasure and an honor to be moderating this panel, which is about creative cities. And I thought I would show that that clip, which is the trailer for Happy Together, for, for a lot of reasons. One is because uh, it, uh, it was actually released in 1997, so just last year, the 20th anniversary of, of the handover, and it was shot in Argentina. Uh, so this is quite special. I think it's a good way to frame our conversation today, which is creative cities. Um, and so I thought I'd start by asking a few questions and then opening it up to the floor so we can have a, a conversation. So um, I, I'm going to ask each person what you think the most exciting, if you, just, if you could just pick one upcoming event or development in, in your projects or in your cities that you're most excited about, what, what, would, what would it be? So let's, let's do it very quickly, I think. So uh, we'll start with, um, with, with Magnus and then... Um, well, I don't want to, to steal Duncan's thunder, but I'd say M plus. I think is going to be ex ev you know, the the. Uh, <laughs> You're not excused, Duncan. You have to stay. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but I think that M plus has got the the potential to be absolutely transformative for Hong Kong yeah. in many ways. In a scene that's been very market driven, I think that that M plus is going to provide a, a much needed antidote to that. Great. Okay, um, Madam Lan, what what do you think is? <coughs>我觉得其实让我最兴奋的就是我们从一个几个人的一个小机构现在发展到全国有七个国家然后还有很多的这个艺术活动和公共的展区然后要越来越多的人能够认识和了解艺术和了解艺术的这点是让我很兴奋发展
And I think that's something that, you know, credit to Hong Kong government, other governments, they recognize the importance of creativity. In terms of quality of life, in terms of transforming the expectations of society, um, you could talk about GDP growth, you could talk about, you know, uh, the jobs for the future. Well, where are the jobs for the future going to be? Honestly, in the creative industries. Artificial intelligence is taking everything else over, but nothing can take over the mind, and I think that's what the future really is all about. Right. I think that cities as well are great aggregators. I mean, they bring people together from such diverse backgrounds, and I think the internationalism of Hong Kong is one of its absolute strengths, that you know, when you get people coming together from all sorts of different backgrounds, bringing in different influences, different ideas, you, you, it leads to the more rapid and accelerated exchange of ideas, which leads to, to new and exciting things happening. Um, Alexandra, I'm coming from a city where we have still shanty towns in the middle of the city, you know, and a lot of people has not access to culture. And there is in Argentina still, being one of the most exciting, rich countries, still there is a lot of difference in between the people and the access to the culture. So for me, the creativity is not only to improve the artists, to give the tools, to give the money, to allow the people to create, also is how it's important that the culture in all the different ways and disciplines could make a social change in the real society, in the people and the children that are now five, six, seven years, that later they can arrive to the university, they, they have and they should to be access to all the knowledge that the people with more money and more wealthy they have right now in Argentina. This is, it has to be one of the main goals for us and also not only for the Argentinas, the politics and all the, the society. Uh, 所以更多的人来关注这个事儿那么到公司创造出来的那么现在肯定变了我们所有的生活改变了我们的工作改变了我们的工作改变了我们的工作改变了我们的工作改变了我们的工作改变了我们的工作改变了我们的工作改变了我们的工作改变了我们的工作改变了我们
You know, people you know, at that time pay a lot more attention to how to make money. But today is different. You know, in, our, in the course of work, we see changes. Many people now started to be interested in arts. The first reason is because when the economy is developed to a certain extent, then people start to need culture and need art. And also, young people who grew up in this stage, they, have, they were educated overseas, and they have their own cultural pursuits. So they are paying more and more attention to developing this one. And of course, there's the influence of Hong Kong and other Western countries. There are more and more museums and galleries that were introduced. Uh, important artists and artistic institutions to Shenzhen, and therefore uh, you know, people getting more interested in it. And our own local artists, there are a lot of them that um, you know, through Beijing and Shanghai, they start to be very interested in Shenzhen. I believe you know, the art scene in Shenzhen is becoming better and better. You, you uh, Madam Luan touched on an issue of, of really audience development. Uh, like in Shenzhen, it, 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 she's saying that when they started, they, they would have programs where barely anyone showed up. And I'm just wondering, uh, you know, both for Hong Kong, especially for, for M Plus, and in the experience of creating Art HK, which became Art Basel, and in Buenos Aires, like, uh, how have you confronted and uh, how are you confronting this issue of building audience, of, of, of developing audience? Well, with the um, with the early days of, of Art Hong Kong, we, we really um, built it on three core values, which is quality, geographical diversity, and accessibility. Accessibility was crucially important. Um, we wanted to make it something that was open to everybody. Um, art is about ideas. Art is about um, artists are trying to understand their own place within the world uh, and and the world itself. And I think that. that those are issues that we're all kind of facing as human beings. It's part of the human condition. Um, the sort of issues that artists are involved with of love, loss, sex, death, man's inhumanity to man, they're, they're issues that, that we all face. And uh, so I think that sometimes the art world can be a little bit self-referential, a little bit navel-gazing, um, and a little bit uh, intimidating. So it was very important for us, especially engaging with a relatively new uh, an audience that was relatively new to engaging with art, that we could try and make it as open as, and as accessible as possible. And that was done through um, education programs. We worked with uh, Asia Art Archive, Claire's, I can see, sitting in the front row, and obviously Alex is very closely involved. Uh, also with Parasite Art Space, who were uh, conducting guided tours that could unpackage uh, some of the art on show. Um, so uh, it, I think it was it was really central to the success of things, and we saw, you know, people were quite skeptical initially as to whether or not the art fair would take root here. A lot of people talked about it being a cultural desert at the time when we when we first arrived, which wasn't the case at all. But uh, uh, but quite rapidly, uh, through creating an event where, whereby we could try and get the general public to attend, um, you know, the, the the audience grew very rapidly from 19,000 the first years to 27,000 in the second year. To you know, by the time that Art Basel came on board, we had an audience of around 55,000 per you know over a five-day period, which I think also gave the government a certain amount of confidence as well that West Kowloon was going and M Plus was going to be able to to generate an audience. I think that. Uh, um, uh, it really demonstrated that there was an audience for art and, and creativity in Hong Kong. Thank you. I will just jump to Buenos Aires for a little bit. Um, I can explain you the situation, what I understand through the, as a director of a museum, you know. So, but for me it's important when I arrived to Buenos Aires first to understand really how, which way which one it was our different audiences, you know? So first to make a, a analysis about who were there, you know? Because of course that you have to work to, to, make, to be loyal to the audience that you have, but later to work really hard to the ones that they have not the access to that for many reasons. One's because they are lazy, they are not interested in art. The other ones because, you know, they don't feel that it's interesting the program or because they don't see that it's diverse and they are inclusive in the program. So we were... Right. And just to dial back uh, quickly for people who don't know the program of Malba, can you ex quickly explain the origins of, of the museum and, and what the current program is like? 
So you want that they work? Just a little, no, just a little uh, example of, of how Malba was founded and what, what you present now. So to give it a framework. Because so, I think... you know, Malba is a museum of Latin American art, mainly for uh, modern and contemporary art, founded in 2001 by Mr. Costantini. He is a collector, it's a private museum. And uh, so the program is mainly focused on Latin American art. Um, but the thing that I was trying to do is to work trans in a transversal way for the different departments and understand that the work that we are developing is something not only internal, we have to build bridges with the different communities, local, national, and international. So we're working really hard to understand who are the people that they never access to Malba for many reasons, because they have to pay a ticket, because maybe they thought that it was so intellectual or so boring, I don't know, you know, there are people that they are not interested in. And we were building one by one, face to face. That's why public programs, education, it's so important. Made in also a lot of alliances with many festivals in the city. The Festival of Literature, Filba, the Festival of Cinema, the Gay Festival for Gender, the Festival of Dance. So this, it helps us also to have a public and to understand much better where it was the interest for the different communities. Also to work really hard with the people that has not the access for social and economical reasons. We are really close to one of the main important shanty towns in the city, so we started to develop, you know, different programs, because the young kids feel that they arrive to the museum and it's like a cathedral. This place doesn't belong to them. And it's like, no, you are really welcome and you can do many things here. You can you know, this is also your house. But for that, you have to understand what kind of culture they have and not to teach them because many of these immigrant people, many of these people from the north of Argentina, they have his own culture. They have the traditions, they have the, 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 the kitchen, the cook uh, culture, they have the oral culture, and you have to develop programs also in relation with that. On the other hand, we were really, really, uh, we took advantage in the way that we wanted to create a very diverse uh, public. So 45, yesterday I was talking about this, 48% of our collection now represent women artists. When I arrived, it was 17%. 17. One seven. One seven when I arrived, and now it's 48. There was only eight countries from Latin America represented in the collection. Now it's more than 14. So this, it gave you the idea. Also, nobody was talking about indigenous Latin American or black America. Because remember, under post-colonial issues, Latin America has a double, double issue. One is the primary nations people when the Spaniards and the and the Brazilians uh, and the Portuguese arrive. But don't forget the the main population. Also, it was all the slavers that were brought from Africa to Latin America, and they had no land, they had no money, and mainly Brazil is one of the main important countries for the tradition for the black tradition. But we have to remember, and we have the goal to teach and to encourage the people to think about the past. Because, for example, in Argentina, no one thinks about the African past. They feel that all of us, we are Italians, Spanish, or Jewish, or Armenians. And that's also our world, you know, to educate, uh, in, educate in a very diverse way. Yes, thank you. Um, and I'd uh, like to uh, touch on, I'll follow up on something after, but and you hinted on this, and that's the issue of um, social economic class and art. And uh, th that's, uh, I'm just wondering for M Plus, uh, for West Kowloon, how are you approaching this issue in a city like Hong Kong? Um, and I'll ask you about Shenzhen as well. Just to answer the previous question yeah. first, the, the issue we face, of course, we don't have a museum. We haven't had a museum. We won't have for probably a couple of years, maybe two or three years. So audience building is all about outreach. It's all about talking to people through all the different channels and media that you have. Um, online, we've done programs online um, through begging, borrowing space. Um, we've done programs with artistry. For example, we did a great exhibition of um, the SIG collection, which is our foundational connection. We do a lot of educational programs. We reach out. Uh, every year we have an annual camp. We take 
hundred odd young people out with curators, with artists, and work together. Uh, we've created a, um, a traveling artist studio in a container. We call it M Plus Rover, and we take it out to the different schools and districts. Um, and we're building the audience even before and in parallel with building the building. You have to. If you look at it across the district as a whole, it's the same issue for us. Hong Kong has a very strong foundation of culture. I think, you know, it, it's evident. You go out to any of the districts, you can see programs, you can see events, you can see there's a fantastic art with a disabled group here, there's a fantastic group of um, miniature modelists. There are so many different aspects of this. The challenge for us is to really get a focus and an identity and to try and develop it to the next level. So we work with partners. You know, Asian Art Archive is a partner for this. Has to be. Um, so to come back to the second question, which I can't quite remember, to be honest with you. <laughs> how, how, do you how do you bridge, not quite bridge the gap, but how do you address audiences of different yeah. socioeconomic class? Um, it's perhaps less stratified than in Argentina and Buenos Aires. However, I think this attitude, well, that's a palace that we're not party to, it's not our place, is still something that you have to address. And you do that by getting to people young. It's the best way. By giving them a reason. If you look at the, the video that's showing, you'll see there are shots of people just in the park. What we're saying to them is this is your space. You tell us how you want to interact with the space. Bring your dog, bring your cat, bring a bottle of wine, sit on the grass, and just enjoy it so that it becomes a familiar space for them so that it isn't this them and us. I mean, there's a tendency, I mean, let's be quite frank, this institution that we're in, and we're, uh, you know, Art Basel represents one end, but you've also got to get entirely the other end understanding the value to them. And the way that we're doing it is to explain to them, there are jobs here. And, and th that's 20,000 jobs, right? At least. I mean, I already have over 5,000 workers on the site building the thing. You know, that's today. Um, so jobs, very important. Once you've got them to understand the economic value, then you can start to get them to understand the social value. We're dealing with situ, which is one of the most traditional forms of art, a Chinese opera, Cantonese opera, very small audience base. How do we make that a much more diverse, much bigger audiences? So these are the challenges, and you do it through education and being persistent. Right, thank you. I just want to quickly go to Shenzhen, though, and that, because um, I'm a very big fan of, of what OCAT has done. I remember going for the first time uh, maybe 15, 10, 15 years ago, and now you have a jazz festival, you have like video-based performances. You have a wonderful constale, essentially. And uh, in fact, sometimes uh, I go up there with friends or with, with other art lovers just to see the exhibitions. How? And I see that you know it's not just people who are likely collectors. It's I see young people. I see young families. How did you, in a way, uh, build that audience, especially because Shenzhen is a place where you have people with a lot of money and people who are like migrant workers? How, how did you approach that for... OCAT. Uh, for Shenzhen, in the case of Shenzhen, it's an immigrant city, so uh, in OCAT's perspective, all of our constituent uh, buildings and um, our are based in communities, are built in communities, which are very diverse communities. And you have working class people, you have investors, and then you have students, and sometimes you even have a full time housewife. So these are the people we have here. So uh, faced with such a diverse audience group, we have to uh, work towards building to them. So in, in Shenzhen, uh, when we are, we, we are located in this, um, uh, 
这个 OCT 展览 ，OCT 出版 ，Site of Creative、uh, Creative Industrial Park。So we have、uh, publishing wing， we have、uh, screening， we have residents， we have OCT performance。Um, so we have different sectors, so which also is looking at programs. So we have public programs as well. This one is like、uh, murals. We've invited、uh, Zhang Xiaogang and Wang Gangyan, Fang Lijun, to, to, to do murals for, for the three、uh, metro stations、uh, near OCT. OCT.、Uh, so they paint uh, large scale、um, paintings for, for these、um, stations. So these professional、um, events and programs. We have also some. Um, more uh, accessible、um, programs such as the Jazz Festival, the sixth one we have this year that you mentioned, and also creative、uh, festival and also a cartoon festival and Tima. Which is a by week by a fortnightly、um, event. We invite young upcoming professionals,、uh, designers, come to this market to showcase their,、um, their design, and you can actually sell、uh, at the market. So this kind of inspires passion about、um, the passion about us in Xi'an, in Beijing.、Um, of course, mostly in Shenzhen, we have different academic orientations. Not just professionally, we were actually.、Uh, To a very high standard, academic standard. In addition to this, in public programs, we we are hoping that build on our academic excellence, we would try to appeal to a more a wider audience. So just to echo. Um, uh, we we shouldn't uh, our panelists, uh, panel panelists, we shouldn't see let people see it at art as an average hour or as a cathedral. I think it, we want to make it part of our life. I think we partially succeeded in that. I think OACT has become part of Shenzhen's life. Thank you. And of course, you've had the 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 advantage of having a lot more time while like M Plus is still being built and and everything else.、Uh, sorry, I, I had interrupted you. I, uh, How 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 do you approach it? In,、uh... No, I wanted to give you just one example. For example, about all of this relation in between economy, society, and and museums, all the access to the culture. For example, we have one program during many years where. The people from the pedagogical and educational department goes to different schools, not in the city, in the suburbs. You know, remember that Buenos Aires, we are eight millions in the center and ten millions around. And the circle, this we call the Gran Buenos Aires, the big Buenos Aires. Mainly, it's、uh, there is all kind of of different uh, 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 people, classes. They call classes,、uh, but there is a lot of people under under.、Uh, Uh, an estimation economical situation. So we work really hard with, with different schools, where every morning from 10 to 12 we open the museum at 12. More than 600 students, mainly for the primary schools, comes. 300 from private, really wealthy schools, British, lycée français, blah blah blah. 300 no, and the st the, the, the students. Coming from the primary schools, really wealthy, the the private ones pays for the ones that they have not access, and they understand these people that has the opportunity and has the money to build the future of Buenos Aires as a big city, as a cultural city, understands just when they are ten, twelve, fifteen years old that they have one goal, one goal. You know that they have the necessity to give. They they belongs you know the economy the welfare that they have for the people that they don't have and also to not only to give in the sense to feed the people you know to create platforms and to create something for the future of well for the welfare that later it's coming and it's part of the sharing structure this is one of the most success programs it's just an an example no and on the other one is like you saw all of the time I try to do so many exhibitions and projects. Not only inside the museum. What does it mean a museum? The museum is not only the white wall. You know, it's the relation and the exchange, the sharing. So, for example, you have this project of Leandro Erlich when we cut. 
the most important monument in Buenos Aires, the obelisk, in the most wider uh, avenue in the world, Nueve de Mayo. So everyone, every the taxi drivers, the people in the schools, everyone was really shocked about what it was happening there. And later we put just the last part in the outside of the of the museum. It was completely a free project. You know, we tried to do even being a private museum where we get money from the tickets and it's really important. You know, we don't have the money that we want, or, or all the money, but we try to create new audiences to feel that the art and the culture is part of the day life and later they can come to know more about the things that there are inside the museums for the Frida Kahlo's, Diego Rivera's, uh, Mira Schendel, or other important pieces from the avant-garde and the contemporaneity of Latin American art. All right, thank you. Um, so challenges. What, what's, what has been the, the toughest uh, hurdle, in a way, uh, to, to realizing you know, the goals that, that you reach? I think, and if you can start with Vagas, like when seeing how this has all developed, what was, what was the toughest thing for you? Uh, 2008 was the launch edition of the fair uh, Lehman Brothers were our lead sponsor um, <laughs> that gives you a bit of an indication um, uh, but I, I think initially uh, it was just a very different time when we were trying to persuade galleries to come to Hong Kong in t uh, starting, I mean, we started recruiting galleries in 2007 everybody was saying why Asia, nobody really understood the potential of Asia at that moment. Um, obviously, nobody's saying why Asia now, but um, uh, but it was, I think, sort of just establishing our, our, our credentials and our credibility. We didn't have a background in art fair organization. We were just starting out. But I think that uh, really going out there early on and trying to establish uh, uh, a support network within the city and to try and make it seem... Uh, or to try and make uh, to try and communicate that this could be something that could be good for everyone. One of the things that art fairs have the potential to do is to put the spotlight on a particular uh, city for a particular moment, and you can either sort of keep that all to yourself, or you can actually use it as an opportunity to showcase the great things that are happening within the city. And we were we were really thrilled that um, we were able to work with uh, organisations like Asia Art Archive, like Parasite. Uh, and to and like Photon, for example, to actually send journalists to discover these places who perhaps hadn't come across them before, send VIPs and collectors to discover um, uh, artists. And actually, I think that there's there's been a an increased awareness amongst commercial galleries from elsewhere in the world who've started taking on board some of the artists from Asia uh, and and from and from Hong Kong as well. So I think there are these uh, sort of I think there are these indirect benefits um, that come as a result, but certainly I think establishing our uh, our, our, our credentials and uh, some black swan events were, were particularly challenging for us. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. Um, Madam Luan, like what, what, what continues to be the biggest challenge for you? I think for me, for OCAT, the largest challenge is how to persist and you know, continue with the current model that we have. Well, because we are now more dependent on the people who are who is running the show. You know, if he or she persists, then the whole thing can continue. But if there are any changes to the people or to the person who is running it, then the sustainability of, the, what, of what had been successfully done would become questionable. What I mean is uh, the challenge is to build a sustainable uh, operating model uh, that you know, can adhere to our independent, professional and just uh, core values. Now this is something you know, uh, uh, like, a, like a food for thought for us, you know, searching for a sustainable uh, museum operation uh, in China. Um, where do I start? There's a challenge around every corner. Um, from recruiting the right people, and we have some fantastic people. I just see you two guys at the back, you're okay. Um, to the imminent opening of the Situ Center, to dealing with issues relating to snakes in the park. You know, I have a multitude of challenges. Um, 
uh, someone asked me recently what keeps you awake at night and it's not so much what keeps me awake at night is how on earth do I get up in the morning uh, it's you know it's a challenge that is so wonderful to have you you can't imagine being involved in a project of this scale and you know potential impact it's just so wonderful if I was to put my finger on the, the immediate challenge, the one that I'm worried about today, it's literally, what are we going to do to build that audience for the C2 Center? We open it end of this year. It's going to be a wonderful facility. But where are we going to fill the seats? Where are we going to find that younger audience that will allow us to sustain it going on to, into the future? I'm sure the first few days will be, it'll be packed. People just want to see it. Sustaining it, right. that's the challenge. Right. Maybe you can distribute tickets to the queue outside. Yeah, yeah, by the way, um, <laughs> free tickets. anyone who wants a free ticket, just see me later, <laughs> or Alison at the back. Uh, she's very happy to give out tickets. Um, Did you see the queue? It's yeah, like, I saw amazing. that. We're, we're actually going to come next year and just sort of give things out. <laughs> it's, it's gone all the way up to the to the, to the uh, crosswalk yeah. near, near yeah, going to the Chinese embassy. It's like... Amazing. Um, yeah, so, Justine. <laughs> so, when I arrived at the museum in 2014, and even right now, the big challenge, it was, and still it is, how to manage an institution developing long-term projects when your annual budget and the annual economy in the Argentinian uh, day life has inflation of 42 percent the first year 30 the second year and still now is 25 percentage so imagine that the money is like uh, you get for example one million dollars in january but later on may it's liquid on your house is 700 on october is 600 and when arrive december you have 550 <laughs> thousand so imagine how difficult and how ch you know you need a lot of challenge and you know to take risk how you manage a program doing partnership with international institutions like Metropolitan Museum in New York, like National Gallery of Canada, like, you know, museums in Europe and also uh, Humex Museum in Mexico. So it's really hard. The good thing, it's a double, the good, this is the bad thing. The good thing is like, I made that MA on economics <laughs> during these four years. I feel that I know more about economy and how to manage and run an, a, 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 you know, a, a company because it was something, being European, being a director during 10 years, being comfortable in Spain, having you know, a very good budget, annual budget for the government, being in a public institution, you know, in the welfare society of Europe, even later that became really critical, you know, after 2009. But even like that, when the Europeans, we talk, and even the Spanish, the Spaniards, we talk about the crisis, I said to my friends, you know, darling, you don't know what does it mean crisis, you know, even if you are really fucked up now in Spain, you don't know what does it mean crisis if you, know, if you are not in a country like Latin America. So this, it was really hard. But on the other hand, I have to say that one of the most incredible things in Argentina is like the artists and the collectors and the people, they understand the responsibility and they have an amazing creative mind to with few money, they create amazing things, and they share a lot. Uh, someone, they give for free a space to a junk artist, uh, they order some money to a collector, so they know how to manage, and they, you know, they made a really high standard production with really few money, but with this net of sharing all of these relations and on the goods, you know, that they have. This is really incredible. I think that this is one of the main uh, incredible things that I experienced during the, all of these years. Thank you. Um, you know, we've been talking about ourselves, and I can, I can we have so much else we, I, we, we could like discuss about ourselves, but I think we should be generous and open up uh, the conversation to the audience. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, we welcome them. Now, there's a mic. There's the mics over here, so just raise your hand and it'll get to you. Good afternoon. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, in Buenos Aires, 
your um, challenge or your target is very much uh, society oriented, whereas Hong Kong and Shenzhen is uh, more tourism oriented or, an, uh, yes, well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> you can contradict me. Maybe it is because um, I'm a director of a museum. I come from a curatorial background, you know. So maybe this man has a big, big <laughs> companies to run and to understand more the global view. My my view is more is more is more like to have is a day life thing more in a very small scale. I think that. Kong Loon is really impressive. This man has to deal every day with so many things around, not only a museum, like five museums, two museums, three, five. five. Yeah, arts, performing arts. Performing art, gardens, you know. So I think. Snakes. Yeah. So it's a different point of view. That's why when I got the invitation by our Basel and Alexandra, I say I can speak through my experience. Being a director of a museum, you know, and has the relation. Also, Malva, it's a very small museum. You know, we have 2,000 square meters for show space. Only in Plus is going to have 17,000 square meters. So imagine for a collection space, I have 700 square meters. They are going to have, you know. So I think it's a really, and that's interesting, you know, that all of us, we have different perspectives and also different approaches to the public and the society. Right. And just quickly, what just, is your audience numbers? How many uh, people do you welcome to your museum every year? All, every year, 400,000 people. 400,000. And it's the biggest, I think, together with Fine Arts Museum. In uh, Argentina. In Argentina is the closest. The other museum is Fine Arts and us. We are the biggest, uh, with the biggest audiences. Right. Can, I, can I just come back on our target? Yeah. Don't get the impression that we're all about tourists. We're not. Tourists are part of our yeah. target. And I'm sure you want tourists as much as we do, yes. let's be quite frank. 50% but is tourists. the core of any museum has to be its domestic audience. It has to be. Yeah. And you're, you're building it for Hong Kong. We're building for Hong Kong. We're building it for Hong Kong. If it works for Hong Kong, then it'll work for tourists. You know, if I, as a tourist, if I go somewhere, I don't want to be stuck in something that's purely for tourists. I want to be where people domestically are there, the people who are, you know, coming from the public housing estates or from you know, the peak, it doesn't matter. They're the target. The tourists are the bonus. And let's be honest, they'll be paying for it all eventually. <laughs> I forgot to comment that Malva, for example, 50% of our income and tickets are from tourism, mainly Americans, Brazilians a lot because they are very close. We have all the so, but it's fifty. So it's the same. It's the same. And in Shenzhen, uh, what are your audiences? For us, uh, we actually to be very lucky. Our uh, uh, galleries do not collect a ticket, box office uh, revenue. Uh, we have a stable support uh, from the um, the uh, OCA group. Well, we do not have a very large budget to use when compared to others. However, uh, it is ample for us. We use some money in effective, uh, if, you know, we use it effectively on projects that, that's worth the money. We are talking about Shenzhen today. However, say in Xi'an, our Xi'an venue, you know, at the beginning, uh, uh, the audience um, does not really understand contemporary art because it is a hugely uh, traditional place. However, when we uh, launched our branch there, we did a lot of uh, public release and public uh, education work. And, you know, despite that, we do not have a lot of exhibitions on a yearly basis. However, we do have finances that are targeted for public education. So in Xi'an, uh, we organize a lot of conversations you know, for non-artic people. Let's say during the weekend, uh, we hold a lot of events and activities for the citizens and for the students, etc. So, based on the different target group, we designed different public activities so that a lot more people can actually come to the world of art and not only tourists.
Magnus, do you want to... Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think that the idea of, of t tourism uh, and local audiences is a really interesting one. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, just to reframe it slightly is to talk about audiences in terms of local and international audiences. And I think that Hong Kong is in this really, really extraordinary position. There's probably nowhere in the world where which would be a better context for the, for the museum that's being built here. And I think there's a real need to provide a counterpoint to the Western-dominated view of, a, of art history. And Hong Kong's in this unique position in that it's neither convinced by a Western-centric view of the world, and nor is it beholden to a, a kind of a dominant domestic cultural agenda. Uh, and so I think it has huge, huge credibility and huge convening power. And the fact that there are so many people coming through Hong Kong all the time also means that it has an incredible role, as a, uh, or the potential to have an incredible role as a, in terms of cultural advocacy, that people who come to Hong Kong can discover, discover the great work that's being produced in the region, the great artists that have been uh, nurtured locally, uh, and take that away with them all around the world. So that, that, that there's just an extraordinary opportunity there, and I don't think people really quite realise yet the potential of the impact that M Plus could have. It could be absolutely transform transformational, not just for the city, but actually for the world's understanding of what it means to be global. Can, can I just add to that? I think I agree entirely with what, uh, what Magnus is saying, but one of the most important things is we can do things here that you can't do in the rest of Asia. You know, we do have the fundamentals set out in the basic law to protect freedom of expression. And that gives us the opportunity to do things that, uh, you know, will attract people simply because they can't see it. Uh, so I think there is that opportunity as well. I mean, if you look at some of the artwork here, it couldn't necessarily be presented elsewhere. But it can be presented in Hong Kong. And I think, you know, if you look at it and you extend it into the performing arts field, you know, <laughs> there are chances for us to, to really open debates about things that couldn't be debated elsewhere. And I think that's really important. And uh, I'm just going to throw in Taiwan. I know it's a Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Buenos Aires uh, conversation, but Magnus, you're looking at uh, a new project in Taiwan that launches next year. How are you looking at this local versus foreign binary as far as uh, an art fair goes, like a new art fair? Um, so, uh, thank you for the plug. Um, we're we're, we're launching an art fair in, in Taiwan next year called uh, Taipei Dangdai, uh, which is going to have around 80 galleries. Uh, and we, you know, I think that Art Basel has now really asserted itself as the global art fair for Asia. There's, I think that that position is, is, uh, is, is clear now. Um, but I think that there, there's the room now for different, a different level of art fair for domestic art fairs around the region to step up a gear. Uh, a lot of the local art fairs are organised by the Gallery Association, which are merit, uh, sorry, democratically determined rather than meritocratically determined. Um, and so there's a need to bring in sort of global standards of practice in terms of selectivity, having a selection committee that can re review all the applications and ensure that there is a, a strong lineup of galleries. And that is really important in terms of giving credibility to the local galleries that are participating, because if they're seen through the lens of a selection process, that they really actually belong there alongside very strong galleries from elsewhere in Asia and elsewhere in the world, um, that can become an imprimatur of quality that really... Um, helps them to establish credibility within a domestic audience and within an international audience. What about audience? audience? Uh, for us, I think that we're, we're, really, um, we're in, really interested in trying to develop the audience at every possible level. Uh, accessibility, again, is going to be one of the key things that we want to, to, uh, to drive um, to sort of demystify the art buying process to try and demystify the art world to a degree. There are very established collectors in Taiwan. There are collectors that have been buying from galleries for many years. There are, there are collectors that haven't bought at all from galleries and have been buying exclu exclusively from auction. Uh, and then there's people that haven't been buying art at all and, and, uh, and uh, just the general uh, museum going public. But um, audience development and accessibility is going to be crucial to our, to our activities and to building the pipeline for, for, for new collectors and new patrons for the future. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, the, one last question, then I'm afraid I'm out of time, so we'll take this one. Hi, uh, my name is Raj. Um, you know, the, if you look at late, late 70s, early 80s New York, which was the, the hot time, you know, the end of the Warhol era, New York, new wave, and the Lower East Side, and what happened was there was a lot of 
grime. There was a lot of grime that gave the rise to Basquiat, Keith Haring, and all that. And without that, you know, pre-Reagan, pre-crack cocaine thing that was New York's um, petri dish, you wouldn't have New York today as an art center. I don't think it'd be. And New York is getting more boring. That was established. That's you can smell that, right? It's too clean and it's too um, gentrified now. So that authenticity that was there then is what gave it the idea, of, even still later, to be a creative city. Yeah. Right? When I see west uh, the, the Kowloon um, waterfront, even from here, all I see is new. And so are you doing things? Are you, how are you preventing yourselves from being slaves to the developers? You know, just building all new, which is an Asian obsession, not all the way to Japan, right? All the way to Toronto. It's an Asian obsession. The developers have such strong power to do that. How are you preventing that? Because that authenticity, um, you know, it's it's not only necessary to to keep that creativity, um, that yeast going, but also, you know, if the the world's population, uh, definitely the United States and Asia, it's going to be dominated by millennials who are not obsessed with opulence. They're not staying at the Shangri La. They're staying in Taiwan, Ch- right? You look at William Kentridge, and he's even his. Um, installations now at um, SF MoMA or the, the Met in New York, he takes the opulence that's around all the Rodans in which he's situated and puts up sheetrock and turns it backwards so it looks crappy. So it looks yeah, a little uh, bit down, you know, grimy. Yes. What are you doing to, to Thank you know, you. not have that opulence? Sorry, we that. have 30 seconds left. Um, well, for a start, we're not involving the developers in developing the art. That's a very important point of principle. Um, you, you keep them out of the art, but you bring them in to pay for it. You know, someone's got to pay for it. Let's be quite frank. Hong Kong, I think, has, has a wonderful tradition. And if you go out to uh, Yamade or you go out to Mong Kok or you go out to Guntong, there are artists working in spaces that shouldn't be used for that purpose. Um, what we're trying to do is to give them the space to, to operate. And, you know, we, I was talking yesterday about um, an artist hostel that we're, we're developing now, where there will be spaces, subsidized, free space for artists. We're going to bring the artists into the district so that they have the opportunity to create for themselves. Um, but the great thing about Hong Kong is that there are so many spaces. If you go to Dai Kuan, for example, that's going to be a great space for them. If you go out to... Um, uh, uh, um, Aberdeen, you know, Guangzhou Town, fantastic spaces coming up all over, all the time. The, the challenge in Hong Kong, and we cannot ignore this, is the cost of the property. If you're trying to get a, a space, it's going to cost you. So our role is to provide that space, f- both for young up-and-coming artists, but give them a chance to rub shoulders with a very established artist, get that inter- interaction going, and create something new. But I agree with you. You've got to have a bit of grime in there. And so, yes, we're not going to be perfect. You know, we're going to have the graffiti. We're going to have all of these different art forms. But it's all going to be given a, a focus. And I think, I hope, that West Kowloon will give them that focus. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Wan would like to reply. I'd like to respond to this, too. In Shenzhen, you actually will see, of course, we have new architecture. You will also see many uh, you know, not-so-tidy places that are also in to art so that more people can join us. So the uh, Shenzhen Hong Kong uh, Architecture Biennale uh, is located in Nantou Gucheng. It's the main site, and which is its an ancient city. I think that Nantou Ancient Town was part of the uh, uh, the town uh, uh, is under the Baoan County. Uh, um, was probably not so clean, not so many uh, concentration of, uh, high concentration of skyscrapers. So you could still create interesting art that attracts a lot of young and old artists from across the world. Uh, they got inspired there and they, they created a lot of interesting works of art. So ACAT uh, all OCAT venues in China, they are actually um, converted from uh, industrial spaces 
they don't look fancy, glamorous, but it carries a lot of memories. So what the audience member said is a friendly reminder that we have to draw on all resources and penetrate into every corner. I'm afraid we're out of time, so thank you, everyone. Thank you to the wonderful panel we have today. And a special shout out to Stephanie and Louise who have put this together. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing all of you in Buenos Aires, Hong Kong, or Shenzhen soon.